Hi, it's Bumble. Welcome back to my channel. I'm today. Sit down in the wrong order. Today, I'm continuing with my review of the Doctor Who episode Power of the Doctor, which is the newest one, which is like this hour and a half long special. And yeah, okay, let me get back to my notes. Because I'm recording these like back to back for some reason. Anyway, where we last left off with this um, is basically that the Master forced the Doctor to regenerate, and the Master basically, like, regenerated into the Doctor. And, like, the other, basically, um, it's like the, the Master's actual body is, like, dead in a box somewhere, and the Master, it's like basically taking over the Doctor's body, but also, like, literally becoming the Doctor, pretty much. And with the actual Doctor, oh, right, I gotta read my notes with this. Uh, then it's revealed that, like, 13's not actually dead. It's more of, like, the Master's using her body. Not that the Master looks like her, it's just the Master looks like the Master, just, like, in her clothes or some shit. It's more of, like, she's just trapped in her own mind, pretty much. Which is represented as this, like, middle-of-nowhere kind of place in, like, some desert with this phone pole thing. No, wait. I'm sorry. It's like a telephone wire. It's like a telephone. It's a telephone pole. Why did I write the phone pole thing? Which I thought that was kind of funny because it's like, you know, this is a character that goes around in a police box which includes a phone on it and then the thing in the middle is just a telephone pole. But I mean, I guess it also has some symbolism because there's certain people she meets at the telephone pole. So having the pole is kind of like you're on a phone call with yourself. Anyway, um, middle of nowhere place with telephone pole and the edge of a cliff. And if she tries to like go over in the cliff, uh, then she would like actually die and have to regenerate. Not like die where you're perma dead or anything, just like have to regenerate and not be 13 anymore. Uh, fortunately, there's a manifestation of herself taking the ship. I was gonna mess it up, dang it. Manifestation of herself taking the shape-shifting form, there we go, of her previous selves that are trying to stop her from going into the cliff as this manifestation doesn't want her to pass on the situation to the next doctor and also tells her that she could basically reverse the forced regeneration that the master did by trying to get outside help, mostly from Yaz. It's kind of funny that they give her this little pep speech about it, but then it's revealed later that she has this hologram that she put into, like, Yaz, Tegan, and Ace, so she could have helped, like, the whole time with the outside help and not need this little intervention. But you know what? The intervention's cool, and it made me happy, so... Who cares? Um, okay, so now we got that out of the way of basically like, okay, that's what the scene is. Now I can actually gush about it. Um, and that's also why I saved this to the part two. I didn't want to rush over this because I wrote a fuck ton. Uh, yeah, this is the whole part I was surprised no one was actually hyped about. Instead, everyone lost their minds over something that happens at like the very, very end. Um, so it starts out with this cool panning shot where we hear someone talk to 13 wearing this ugly, fancy robe. From what I read, it's supposed to be like some kind of traditional Time Lord robe or whatever, but we've never seen it before. Uh, I think it looks ugly. It's kind of fancy. It's like black with like these red beads or something. In terms of drip level, no drip. Um, but anyway, the panning shot, it starts from the shoes up. And it's revealed, <laughs> revealed to be the first Doctor, even doing that thing he's known for where he grabs the lapels of his coat and kind of like poses and does a pose like when you're trying to be self-important. Um, and I know it's a TV show and, you know, when they introduce, they reintroduce the character, you know, you gotta make it flashy, but like, dude didn't need to pose that much for a dramatic entrance, but whatever... It's the Doctor, so, of course, they gotta be extra. Um, and here's the thing, we've seen the first Doctor, like, five times, ever since, like, 
the second crossover episode where they're played by other people because the original actor, um, William Hartnell, Hartnell, I always mess up his last name, uh, after the first, like, because the first crossover episode with the series was called The Three Doctors, which was actually with The Three Doctors, but the thing is, the actor for the first Doctor, I guess his health was kind of going bad at that point, so he didn't really have a big role, it was just, he, it was mainly just an adventure with two, three, Joe, and Unit, and the first Doctor would, like, it was, like, pre-recorded footage of him talking to them, though that is where we get the cool line about how his successors are, uh, a dandy and a clown, anyway, um, and then after that, by the time we get to the Five Doctors, which is, like, the second crossover, doc crossover episode, he's already passed away at that point, but they still keep bringing the first Doctor into all of these crossover episodes, but always played by different people. Anyway, um, so yeah, over the course of the, all the crossover episodes in the series, he keeps popping up, like, almost all the time, I don't know why. Um, I mean, he's a cool character, but anyway, this is, like, the first time where he feels as close to as he's, like, he was originally played in his own seasons as possible, which is nice. I appreciate that. Because here's the thing, at least in my opinion, like, normally when he shows up, he feels more like he's a parody of himself, which makes me sad, because the first Doctor is actually really cool. Like, if I was doing a ranking, I wouldn't put him in, like, my top favorites. Here's the thing, I think all the Doctors are cool characters, so it's less of like, oh, which ones suck, which one's cool, and it's more of like, which one do I like more than others? And I do genuinely like him, I don't know where he would be on that ranking, the thing is, it's like, I like others more, which is why he's not like in like my top five or something, but he's really cool, I liked his seasons a lot, and that's actually what got me more into classic with his later seasons. Um, like, he's always shown as this, in these crossover episodes, as, like, this, um, stuffy old man who's, like, feels very self-important, very much like a, a boomer parody, um, I guess is the way I could put it, um, which, I mean, I guess that's sort of true, but because of the character development in his, like, I don't know, five seasons, by the time he's traveling with his later companions, uh, Vicky and Steven, which is, like, towards the end of his run, He's not really like a stuffy, overprotective old man. He's basically just like a laid back, slightly grumpy grandfather figure. Like, okay, I know that he's literally Susan's grandfather, um, and that was his first companion, but he was like super overprotective. And then with all the other kiddos, mainly like uh, Vicky and Dodo, he's just a lot more chill. Um, with one of his strongest character traits, I'd say, and the best way I could put it is that he's like a scheming little goblin, uh, which is a trait they never show him, like, having outside of his original run, which makes me sad. And what I mean with scheming little goblin, scheming little goblin, I'm sorry, it's like, I, I try and think of some examples of things, like, he has this laugh, that's the reason, um, my friend and I refer to him as the happy mask salesman, as, like, his nickname is he has this little, it's almost like a little Yoda laugh. I don't, I don't know how to describe it, or I can't really impersonate it, but it's like the closest I can think of is like Yoda or something, like a little ho ho ho. No, 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 it's like a ho ho ho. Uh, heck, I can't get this laugh right. Go, go look at a clip of him from like a meme compilation or something. Um, and he's just like a skinny little guy, like, a, a scene I think about sometimes is like him and his original companions are in like this museum or something and he sees his empty Dalek shell and you don't know he's in there at first it's like it's a shot of like just the Dalek and then the shell pops up and he pops his head out and does this little giggle and I feel like that um describes him perfectly. He just causes mischief. He's just a mischievous little old man. And I think that's great, because you'd think he'd be like... He's like very immature. It's weird, because it's like he's supposed to be an old man, and the doc's supposed to be old-ish at that point, but this is also like the youngest in the show he's ever been. So him being looking like an old man and trying to act like important and shit, 
from what I understand, what this series is basically like the equivalent of like Teenage Rebellion, but like for him and his peeps, it's like instead he's his rebellion is looking like an old man trying to be important, when in reality he's a, he's a goofy little shit. Um, but he's great. Uh, I mean, is this just turning into an ad for telling people to watch his stuff? Maybe. Anyway, I got to bring that up because um, they did him right this time and that makes me happy because that's the thing he's that's one of the strongest character traits I'd say but whenever he shows up again he's just like this wise old man that everyone seems to respect for some reason I don't get it because it's like portraying him in this way as if it's like how he was at the beginning of the show just I feel like, um, is disregarding all his character development and the way his personality ended up actually being for most of this run. Like, why? Oh, hold on a sec. Okay, I'm back. I got interrupted for like a minute. I know my voice had trailed off too. I don't know, I have this like weird set, like, sixth sense type thing of like knowing when someone's gonna go knock on my door and tell me something so it's like my voice just kind of gets like quieter and quieter and I lose momentum and I just start thinking about the door anyway um let me look back at my notes I was looking at this image I have for the thumbnail the one you're looking at right now it looks cool actually I like that um and I like how it spoils the regeneration thing too because like with the color and the way this light is but I think everyone knew she was going to die anyway. Anyway, uh, right, I was talking about the first doctor and him being a spoon little goblin, uh, off-topic-ish, um, yeah, if you've never seen his stuff, I mean, I'd admit it's probably kind of hard to watch, I mean, it's in black and white, there's a lot of, like, episodes that are missing, and the effects are kind of garbage, um, but it's really cool, he's a cool character, uh, go check it out. Go, go check out any of Classic, honestly, especially if you watch this episode, even if you don't get all the references and stuff and it makes you a little bit curious, go check it out, it's great. Anyway, um, so yeah, he talks to 13, he gives her some advice before CGI swapping into, oh, let me talk about the CGI swapping thing. All the effects and, like, visuals for this episode had been really good so far, and then when I got to the CGI face swap thing, it just felt weird, especially in some shots where it's like, it'll rapidly switch between characters. Like, there's a part at the end where each of them say part of a line or something to make a sentence, and it switches, like, in milliseconds. But the way it switches between faces feels kind of weird. Not, like, the CGI in the show sometimes, especially with, like, the 2005 season or with the movie, is, like very kind of creepy and uncanny looking so at least it's not that it's more of just and it doesn't look like garbage it just looks off to me i don't know if that's just excuse me my opinion because i'm used to better cgi and i'm spoiled but i don't know just thought i'd bring that up okay real thing here he um gives the team some advice cgi swaps into five six seven and eight this was easily my favorite part of the special, and was when I realized that the special does a better job of representing the series <laughs> than the fucking 50th anniversary special did. That makes me sad. You'd think for the 50th anniversary of the series, they'd pull out all the stops, they'd bring back the actors. I feel like that would have been the bare minimum. I mean, they sort of do, but it's not with the actual actors, it's just like, pulling archived footage of them and like there's a scene where it's like the dot 11 summons like all the doctors and it shows it like this really cool shot that would, if anything make a cool wallpaper actually that shows all of them together but it's all these like photos and footage it's not actually like any of them there and it just bums me out because like some of them are like so old now and i'm like especially tom baker actually who they did manage to get for that episode he's like pretty old now, so I'm like, why aren't you having these actors come back, um, when it's a part of the plot thing, like, well, we still have them, you get what I mean? I don't understand that. But anyway, yeah, this part, they actually get the actors, 
for this. I mean, except obviously not one because they literally can't. But to get like the other four that we haven't seen on screen in years, and that just <sighs> okay. Oh, okay. I wasn't even reading off my notes for that, and I did write like literally the same thing of just seriously. They didn't bring back any of the other doc actors for that. It was a travesty. It should have been a minimum requirement like that. Okay. Sad thing is, I actually spoiled this for myself. Okay, here's the thing. The day I wa actually ended up watching it, thinking I wasn't going to watch the episode. Because I hadn't really even known this was going to be on. Like, normally I watch this show on HBO Max, but that's not, not a reality anymore. Except HBO Max takes, like, three months to put an episode on, and I knew this was the kind of episode where everyone was spoiled everything immediately. Because I'd seen some thumbnail that day, um, of, like, 13 in the box with the first regeneration, where it, the way the thumbnail looks, it looks like, okay, that's when she's gonna die or something. I mean, she does, but not, like, you know what I mean. Uh, clickbait. Anyway, I'd seen that, so I knew there was a new episode, and I knew that she was gonna die. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe I'll wait till HBO Max, or, you know what, I don't even care. I just want to know how she dies and I'll just skip the episode. That was my original thought. So I thought, okay, I'll just go and read. <laughs> I'll just read on Wikipedia how 13 dies so I can make fun of it like a meme to my friend or something. And then just read about this, um, and then I read about this part. It didn't describe, like, the whole thing, like, how it happens and why. It was like, oh, yeah, she's trapped inside her brain. She meets her previous selves as a manifestation and a telephone pole and, like, any of the things they say to her. It was just more of like, oh, yeah, uh, then, uh, then five, six, seven, and eight show up. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, thankfully it didn't describe the whole scene. It only just said, like, oh, these dogs show up as cameos. But I'm still mad at myself that I did that, because if I hadn't, I swear I probably would have actually screamed when it happened. Okay, maybe it was probably for the best, because I've, like, I know people, like, they get excited, they watch a trailer for something like Smash Bros, for example, and people lose their shit and scream so loud. The thing is, I live with other people, and out of context, if they heard me scream, they would have thought something was wrong. I mean, obviously, I wasn't able to watch any of this live, but, um, you know, so I could have, like, paused at any time, would have been fine. But still would have been a genuine reaction. I've never had that moment with this show where something, ex I get excited, and I find out about something in the episode, and I just lose my shit and scream. But you see, it's the thing, like, when I used to watch this with my cousin, it's like, the show was new to me and stuff, and I wasn't, like, I was into it, but not super into it. And then with Classic, it's like, I actually had to look up the order of all the episodes ahead of time. And the thing with the crossover episodes is they, you know what they are, because they all have a very specific title. So, I already knew about all of those. I, like, would have had to know about those. So, I, like, and then with, um, like, when I finally continued with the new stuff and got to 11 and 12, which I hadn't seen before, it's like, everybody had already known about that and talked about it and memes about it for years. So, I've basically known a good amount of stuff. I guess the only thing that probably would have surprised me was when I watched the 50th and there was that whole little, like, prequel stuff with 8, but, like, I had only seen the movie and didn't really know about him as a character, so I was just like, oh, okay, it's just this doctor. But then with this episode, I had all the context, and I got so excited. Um, I write about that in, like, a few seconds, actually. Uh, but yeah, I'm mad at myself, because that's the thing. People lost their shit about other stuff, so this wouldn't have actually had been probably spoiled for me at all. Except that I spoiled it for myself. Um, this is like the one moment I would have just lost my shit if I didn't know about it ahead of time. Especially because we got to see 8 on screen again. You guys, I was so fucking happy to see my boy. Especially because he even got his own outfit, which is like a different version of the movie outfit. Still got the green coat. Very cool. Um, that's the thing I've noticed with his outfits when he... 
I hate saying this every time he's been on screen. Um, it's always like a variation in the movie outfit, but because it takes always happens like at a later point in his timeline or whatever, it's always like this kind of beaten up outfit, usually with green, but it's still very much you're like, okay, it's still the what is it? What did I say it was? The Wild Bill. I don't remember the full name. Yeah, he steals a Halloween costume in the movie. I still find it hilarious that a signature outfit with how formal and put together it looks at the end of the day is still canonically part of a Halloween costume he stole from a hospital. Anyway, um, I was so fucking happy to see him, you guys, because I've watched all that. I've listened to, like, a season of the audios, but I've gotten, like, a good enough grasp of his character that I appreciate him now, and he's actually, like, one of my favorites because of it. So that was really cool. Um, my favorite part, though, is when 13 asked him, because, like, I mentioned there's the CGI face swap thing, so it's, like, it has these different versions of the doctors, of course, played by the original actors, but they're all wearing, like, the exact same robe. Except for eight, and she asked him that, of course, he's like, hey, why don't you have the robe? Um, and he's straight up just like, I don't do robes. And the first time I watched it, because I watched this episode twice, once by myself and once with a friend, I thought, good for you, dude. He, just, he loves his own aesthetic so much, he wouldn't be caught dead in that ugly robe. But then, oh, I wrote last weekend in my notes, but it's really like two weeks ago. But then I watched the movie, um and realized it might be a plot reason to. Okay, because in the movie, there's like a very specific scene with the master um, where he goes like all out and shit. Uh, and he has this huge flashy like cape rope thing. It actually looks really cool. And I remember, um, I don't remember if I've mentioned this yet. I remember seeing a magazine advertisement. I saw in like a Tumblr post where it was Barbie in that same like place wearing that robe as like a specific crossover with the movie and it had a really funny caption. I can't find it anywhere and I know it's not a Mandela effect because I remember exactly what that shit looks like. Uh, if you're curious, the only Barbie I've been able to find for the series is one of 13. I don't know what that says about our society. I would have fucking loved to have one with that master robe. That was cool. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, in the movie he has a huge flashy cape rope thing. And then the time lords in general, but especially it seems like the higher up ones, uh, usually have these like very elaborate robes, even with like this weird headpiece thing that kind of looks like an hourglass. I don't know how to describe it exactly. Like some of the Cybermen in this episode actually have that too. Anyway, um, and part of Eight's run was kind of this rebelling against the time lords and the whole thing with the time war, which in a way ends up factoring into his death. So plot-wise, honestly, it's no wonder he's like such against wearing robes. Anyway, then he briefly argues with Seven about it, which made me so happy because A, I desperately wanted to see some doctor bicker <laughs> bickering between doctors. We'll go with that um, because it's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite things in the show. I'll be honest. I fucking love the cross-up episodes. Heck. Um, the first crossover episode, the one I mentioned earlier, uh, The Three Doctors. I'm not kidding, that's my favorite episode in the entire show. Uh, because it has my favorite doctor and my favorite companion. More importantly, the entire episode is just two and three arguing with each other like little kids, and it's hilarious. Anyway, um, this was like the only time there was like non-plot related dialogue in this whole like cameo scene. And I'm so glad it was between, like, two of my fav- Seven's in my top five, for sure. Um, between two of my favorites, because they've never had any on-screen crossover episodes with anyone, which kind of bums me out. Like, Five had the whole Five Doctors thing, and Six had a crossover where he's with two in, like, Spain or something. That was kind of a weird crossover episode, actually. Anyway, but yeah, Seven and Eight never got to have a on screen, I have to emphasize that because eight gets a few, but it's all in the audios crossover, and I think that would have been really funny actually. Um, so yeah, this is my favorite part of the whole episode. Uh, even though I knew um, I knew he was gonna show up for it, but 
I still love watching it anyway. Um, yeah, actually getting to see the scene play out with, like, no context. Like, I didn't know about the funny dialogue or about the outfits. I didn't have any visual on what the doctors were going to look like or that it was even a manifestation. I just knew, like, oh, these docs have cameos, so they're going to appear at some point. That's all I knew. Um, so that was really cool. Uh, anyway, then they convinced 13 that she can get out of this situation, and she appears to you as a hologram to guide her, like I mentioned. Uh, then it shows the unit stuff again. Uh, it goes back and forth between, like, Doc Hologram and Yaz, and then some other holograms, and then whatever ha whatever's happening with the unit. But I didn't write a lot about the unit stuff. Anyway, uh, Tegan is explaining all the shit that she's been through the last, like, 30 years to Kate. Um, I always forget. No. No, I don't. She's the lady that's in charge of the unit now, basically. Because, like, the Brigadier isn't there anymore. Anyway, um... And it made me kind of sad when I was listening to Tegan's spiel, because one part of it was something about um, recently divorcing two husbands, and I was like, aw, because uh, Tegan and this uh, misses another companion that like also traveled in turn five didn't end up being a couple, because there was like a lot of little hints and stuff. I mean, I get it was like, at that point in the show, it was in the 80s, so it's not like they could have actually done anything, but it was like a lot of little hints and stuff that seemed like more romantic oriented it, and this is like surprisingly my main ship in the series so to just kind of see it like canically like disconfirmed kind of like made me sad a little anyway um uh then yes uh goes back to the master back in the charge because she talked to the doc they came up with the doc hologram of 13 and they came up with some plan uh they're gonna try and trick the master or something yeah, and then Tegan, she's, like, inside the unit. She's, like, she had to go through some elevator, like, not in an elevator box thing, but, like, down the elevator shaft while getting, like, shot at by Cybermen or something. Um, and, like, I'm trying to, like, visually remember where this is. She's, like, in some place, like, basement level of the unit building. Excuse me. And there's all these Cybermen everywhere, and she has to, like, do something to stop them. I don't remember what. More importantly, um, reading through. Uh, Tegan gets to meet Five again as a hologram. Oh, uh, yeah, I had written more notes about this, and I wrote about this part. I don't know where the hell my notes are, so I have to improvise from this point on for a bit. Uh... Because that's, here's how the little thing set up. It's like the holograms of 13 and it activates because Tegan's in trouble and doesn't know what to do. And she's kind of freaking out about the Cybermen because she doesn't have good, like, memories of them. It relates to something in classic. Uh, I don't have time to explain. Anyway, um, and she's distressed and 13's trying to help her. And then it changes to a hologram of five, and the nice thing with that is it changes to one, like, being played by the actual actor, um, and then he's, uh, of course, as the doc, he's, like, panicking, because he's like, oh, that wasn't supposed to happen, it changes to match your emotions or something, so, a uh, similar thing happens with Ace, where it's basically, like, it changes to match to whoever, like, their doctor is, which I think is pretty cool, that makes sense, because, like, yeah, 13 still the doctor, but it's not their doctor. Then it's not someone they like with all her personality and quirks that they have a connection with. So it makes sense. It goes back to like the version of the doc they knew, and it's kind of nice because it's like with both of the actors for both of the scenes, they're both like older now, and it's kind of like a chance of basically just for five and seven um, to see how their companions turned out in the end. Which I think is really sweet, especially because, like, both of them had a sort of, like, father figure relationship with these two, so I always thought that was nice. Um, and basically, with both of those scenes, I guess I'll talk a little bit about both of them. It's that, like, they sort of reconcile their issues because with Tegan, she was, like, mad about how the doc never visited, like, any of the companions and stuff. 
you know, with Keegan and what happened with Five, it's like basically one of their other companions, his name is Adric, who um, dies, actually, I forgot about that, he's the only companion that dies in Classic, I think because of the Cybermen, which is why she gets spooked, and it's kind of a thing that sort of has an effect on, like, the rest of Five's life and on those companions, it's all something that reasonably they're all kind of haunted by, and he, um, Five comforts her and even proves that he isn't just, like, some hol- that's still, like, with Five and shares the same memories and everything, um, and she sort of just cheers her on and even does the little, like, three part teasing catchphrase thing he always had, and that was really cool. Because that's the thing, it's like, with the turning Sarah Jane thing, for example, it is like another episode in one of the spinoff shows where Eleven gets to meet Joe, I think. It's like, on one hand, it's cool that they get to see the doctor again, but it's like, it's not their doctor, so it doesn't feel quite right. So having it like this, that's the thing I'd mentioned earlier, a little, of like, I was mad that 13 didn't get like a little moment with them, and it's like, on one hand, they do get a moment, it's with their doctor, which is something I appreciate, but at the same time, at the end of the day, it's still a hologram, it's not the real doctor, whether it's 13 or not, so it's kind of like, slightly bittersweet on that note, but I think I like that they got to meet, like, their doctor instead and catch up, it's like more of a reunion between old friends than anything. It's cool. Third? No, I'd say that's my second favorite. That was genuinely really cool. The Master Dancing was also cool, but that's like a short thing. That's like my third favorite, if we're ranking things. Anyway, um... So yeah, Five gets to, um... How can we not read here? Uh... Yeah, she gets to talk to the hologram of Five. Very wholesome. Uh, Ace goes to this volcano to stop the Daleks, um, and gets to talk to a hologram of Seven, of course, which finally gives us a little info on why she wasn't in the movie, because that's the thing with the movie, it's like, classic ends with her and Seven, and they, he gives a little speech, and he's like, come on Ace, we got work to do, and then the movie starts, and Seven's like, much older at the end of his life, and he's completely alone, and we're given no context to what happens to Ace. And I'll say, I haven't gotten super far into the audios. I've only been listening to Ape's audios and not Jake's, so I don't know if there's something in Biggie Finish that gives a little more context on what happened there, but at least with this episode, they try to basically just, like, her and Seven had a falling out due to moral reasons, which, given how Seven is, that actually doesn't, su- and the direction they were planning to take this doctor, if the show didn't get cancelled, that honestly doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, but basically, with her and the hologram, they make up, and they're friends now, and he says so he's proud of her, and that was very cool, honestly. Um, okay, yeah, so she's in the volcano, uh, and then 13's old companion, Graham, who's one of her original companions, is also there too. It's just in the volcano, it, it doesn't even explain how he gets there, it's like, from what I remember with that scene, it's like she has, Ace has the baseball bat, and yeah, it's the same one from that iconic scene where she, like, beat the shit out of the dog in the 80s. Uh, anyway, um, she's there and she hears the noise and she's ready to swing at someone. Graham's just there with the, um, what is it, the fucking psychic paper thing, except that it doesn't work and she realizes he's a friend. Anyway, he, he's just there. It doesn't explain how he got inside a volcano and why he's there, whatever. Anyway, um, and I think they were, like, a little romantically into each other with how that scene played out. Um, doesn't surprise me, Graham being in the strong, independent women is not surprising, but, um, I don't know, never a ship I would have considered, especially because I see Ace, because the thing with Ace is there was a lot of, like, bi, yeah, bi, like, hints-ish with her original one, either bi or, like, lesbian, just her being interested in women, at least was like a lot of hints, especially with her being paired up with um, non-companion characters of them getting along very well, little hints about things, just of her being queer basically, so 
I don't know, even besides that, I can't really t imagine her in my brain, like, with a blue bikini. I've seen her so many times, like, with those handful of, like, clothes, specifically with women. But anyway, they're both cool characters, they deserve to be happy, whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't know why Dan's there, but he's my favorite of the any 13 companions, so I guess I shouldn't complain. Uh, then there's the hologram, it goes, it cuts to the next scene of, like, whatever's happening with the doc and the master. I'm sorry, with the master, the doc doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so yeah, Yaz has him go in the TARDIS, and they head back to the palace in Russia, 1916, and there's a hologram of the fugitive doc. It's like part of a trick with the master, and she's there for like a few minutes, and then the regeneration gets reversed, and the doc's back to normal. Yay! Uh, then we get to see Ace once again beat the shit out of the Daleks with the exact same baseball bat, very cool. She even has, like, the jacket on, too. I always liked her jacket, it looked cool. Anyway, um, then the unit building gets blown up, which I think this is, like, oh gosh, who knows how many times it's happened by now where it gets blown up or something, uh, or damaged or whatever, uh, and Kate and Tegan, yeah, they make it out of the building, like, exactly the same time it blows up, you know, the show, they gotta make it dramatic. Um, yeah, and then the, the rest of the episode's basically like, now that the doc's back to normal and the master is near, she, it's just the doc running around trying to fix everything else going on and basically trying to uh, fix as many plot holes and whatever is possible to keep happening. Um, oh, and then she talks to the sentient energy thing, uh, which got me thinking, other than the next part I'm going to describe, it didn't really have to be a part of the plot at all, it didn't really do anything, it just kind of appears at the beginning at the end. Like, I get that they needed it so that the master had enough, because it was... Okay, so the thing with the, um, the Death Star planet, basically they have, the master, like, is using this sentient energy thing, um, star thing, to, like, power up the planet, and basically using that energy as, like, a giant laser, basically like the Death Star, but instead of blowing up planets, it's, like activating volcanoes on Earth, so like all the volcanoes are like being erupted at the same time, which is causing a disaster, and the doc ends up fixing it by literally freezing all the volcanoes, which is of course the thing would have a huge impact on the environment of the animals, but the doc doesn't care, and even makes a little clip of like, oh yeah, I gave you guys cool like ice sculptures now, but, but it's 13, that doesn't surprise me, um, if we're being clueless, anyway, um, so yeah, the volcano thing got stopped, so I guess the laser's used for that, and also used as, like, energy for powering the force regeneration. But that's the thing, like, it's, like, used for shit, but, like, it doesn't really have a part in the plot anyway. Um, I don't know why it's there. It just felt like a waste of a really cool idea and design. I think the doc, when she first sees it, she's like, wow, it's this, what is it, like a cork or some shit? starts with a Q, some name, like Quark or whatever, she's like, wow, it's this thing, I've never seen one of these things before, and it has this cool design where it looks like a bright light, and it has this colorful lights coming out of it, like the train did, and I thought, yeah, that looks cool, surely they're gonna do something with this, nope, um, then it turns into a giant laser to destroy everything, so the doc's just like, yeah, blow up this planet, even though we're still literally on it, uh, so that ends up wondering, wounding the master, there we go, and then he reverse emo cards it with the remote to get it to blast the dock, um, and just super funny to me to watch 13 get hit by a giant laser, it looked really dumb, uh, so yeah, her and the master both die, but then Yaz, like, steps outside the TARDIS, and they make it, like, this really dramatic moment for some reason of her, like, trying to avoid the laser, and bridal style carries 13 back in the TARDIS, and then Yaz takes everyone home. Because Yaz is one of those companions, kind of like with Clara, where it's like... They eventually get to a point with their adventures where they're basically like the doctor now and do doctor things. Um, so yeah, uh, Yaz takes everyone home. And then 13 just wakes up alone with Yaz. I'm so bummed with that, because I thought we'd finally get, get a final little moment of like... 13's okay now, there's no problem, she can like finally talk properly to Tegan and Ace, maybe we get to see them one more time, no, no, everyone just goes home, they're like, 
I don't know, I think it cuts to black or something, I don't know. And then it cuts back with like 13 waking up, and everyone's gone. Uh, and then her hand gets all glowy, which means she's gonna die soon. And they decide to sit on the TARDIS, like in space, just overlooking the earth and just eat ice cream. I'm not even kidding, by the way, that's exactly what happens. And they have a little chat about stuff, and they're both crying, and Yaz doesn't want to leave because the dog literally kicks out this time and just like, I want to die alone. I'll talk about that in a sec, actually. Um, I honestly wish there were more of these kind of quiet, just dark and companion moments like this. They're honestly really nice with just them, like, vibing. Like, I get that it's supposed to be, it's an important part of what's happening and whatever, but they need their little moment before the dog dies. This is basically their goodbye scene. Um, so they talked for a while, and it would have been sad if I actually cared about either of these characters. Um, but yeah, that's the interesting thing to me with this, too, of, like, so far with the new companion, I say new as in, like, 2005 onwards, it's been, like, a companion gets really close to the doctor, and they never want to leave, and then they get separated by some kind of force whether it be an alternate universe or death. Actually, a lot of companions die this time. Um, not any of the 13s, actually. Most of them, no. All of them decide, like, except for Yaz, that they just want to stop traveling, and the doc's like, yeah, that's cool, bye. But then with Yaz, she, of course, doesn't want to leave. We end up at the doctor's point where it's like, there's nothing else in the plot that can separate them. There's no reason for her to leave, and she doesn't want to, and 13 doesn't want to, except 13. It's like this weird romance thing that happens where it's like sort of a one-sided crush, and 13 knows about this, but, you know, with how the doc's other relationships have turned out, she's like, yeah, it's not worth it, let's not do that, and friend zone set. So I have a feeling it's kind of like that, of like, yes, you can feel like someone who's like in love with the doctor more of just like specifically in love with 13 and the fact that 13 is going to die is basically what separates them of like you know Yaz would still be with the doctor but it's not her doctor anymore it's someone else it's a stranger basically and 13 also cares about Yaz so I'm guessing that's the reason why she made up the excuse of wanting to die alone but yeah she anyway um drops Yaz off where she finds Dan and Graham just realized that's slightly wise. And they take the kid, like, literally a companion support group, which is literally just them sitting in chairs, talking about the doctor and whatever. And I'm surprised that wasn't a thing in the show already, because it seems like a lot of companions knew each other already. Though, of course, since this is a classic who loved episode, none of the modern peeps are there. You know, I don't care. Classic deserves the time to shine. Um, yeah, but a classic, no, not every single classic companion, obviously, but a good amount of them, especially ones like, um, Mel and surprisingly Ian, uh, are there, which is very cool, though they also don't explain how Mel, um, like when we last seen her, if I remember right, she went traveling with this, like, alien explorer guy to go on adventures, and we don't know how she gets back to Earth. Anyway, uh, that was really cool. It wasn't, like, surprisingly a hype moment, even though a lot of companions I liked were there. I thought I was going to be more hyped, because this was actually a part that was a complete surprise to me. I did not know about all the companions coming back. It was very cool. I'm disappointed. I thought I'd be more hyped when it happened. I was just kind of like, oh, cool. Um, even though I recognized all of them. Um, but yeah, then 13 parks the charts on a cliff and dramatically regenerates in front of the ocean and turns into 14. And here's the weird thing with that, with the articles I'd read, it seemed like, oh, okay, we picked, like, the new actor to play the doctor. Of course, this part I was already kind of spoiled on by the internet, too, uh, so I knew it wasn't going to be that actor. They actually changed it, and they brought David Tennant back to be the 14th doc instead. It's basically, like, they're going to have him in, like, three episodes. I don't know if any of those episodes are the 60th. And then we're getting the 15th Doctor, who's played by the new... I, I, don't, I don't remember his name exactly. I, I don't really know who he is. Um, but yeah, regenerates in the 14, who looks identical to 10. 
and he freaks out and he even does that thing that Ken does where he's like, what, what? And then it ends on a cliffhanger. Um, and I know people love the 10th best, so do I, he's my third favorite. Okay, rankings for that would go with like, two's my number one favorite, then eight, then 10. Then probably seven. Okay, doesn't matter. Anyway, um, I'm still surprised that this was the moment everyone lost their shit over. Like, I went on to Tumblr, like, a few days before I'd watched this episode, I'd went on to Tumblr, I'd saw the thumbnail of 13, and I forgot about that. And I thought, oh, cool, I wonder what's under the Doctor Who tag, I wonder if it's any funny memes. And it's all just, like, pictures and gifts with this part, with 14. Um, but yeah, this is the part everyone lost their shit over. And not almost, like, every still living dog coming back for a cameo, and the s or the same thing with a companion. Like, bro, we haven't seen these people in years, and in Ian's case, almost 60 years, like, that's not the thing people got hyped for. <laughs> I mean, I got hyped. That's just me. And I'm sure other people did too, but it's still just like, wow, okay. Priorities there, I guess. Anyway, my closing thoughts for this is this is one of the best episodes I've seen in years for this show, as of like recent stuff anyway. Is it my number one favorite? No. I still really like the other crossover episode better. This is definitely one of the Okay, I can't call this a crossover episode because this isn't a multi-doctor episode, but the fact that it had cameos from a shit ton of people in classic makes it almost feel like a crossover-ish. I mean, they're still just cameos. None of them have to do anything with the plot except for Tegan and Ace, and they're basically like side characters. Okay, this isn't a crossover episode, but it had a lot of cameos, so I liked it. Um, yeah, honestly, having to watch the last three seasons, which I'm not going to make a full video for that because I don't want to talk negative stuff. Uh, I went into those open-minded, same about the Doctor. I knew people didn't like 13. I knew people didn't like the seasons, and I thought, you know what, I'll try it anyway. I've liked all the Doctors so far. I'll give it a shot. Uh, and I came out disappointed. Thir 13 isn't, like, complete garbage, but it also would probably be on the lower of my list. Just didn't... Okay, my issue with her is that, um, she just feels boring to me. She... She feels like a parody of the character, basically. Like, I want to... Like, with the, all the other docs, they always have some kind of weird little, like, quirk soup things, or whatever, like, playing this game, like, food preferences, or little sayings or whatever, and 13 has, like, some of those. I don't know, she does, like, a little face crunchy thing, she wears these goggles and she picks something up. Uh, her title, TARDIS is just, like, crystals or some shit. Um, social, she thinks social anxiety is a personality trait. Um, I, I just, I feel like I'm so partially against her, mostly because there was two scenes that just felt super out of character that happened, and she got away with both of those as a character, one of which was ditching the master to the Nazis, um, and the other one was that a companion confessed about having cancer and openly vented to her and was very vulnerable, and she didn't comfort him at all. She didn't say anything to him at all, other than something along the lines of, like, Oh, yeah, I'm socially awkward. I don't know how to handle this situation, so I'm just gonna not say it. That's literally, like, basically what she said. And it pissed me off so much, because even the docs that are, like, actually more awkward or more grumpy would have at least tried... Like, if they weren't directly comforting, probably would have said some... You know, the doctor has, like, a billion fucking inspirational speeches, even 12 does. So the fact that she just kind of avoided that whole thing was just so completely out of character. And she just doesn't feel interesting to me. Like, even with some of the other doctors that I sort of was like, okay, they're kind of... Not that they're 
fun or like mean or whatever more with like the ones I don't care for as much as others there's at least something about them I find interesting there's at least some funny scene or whatever I can think of that I genuinely like them and enjoy her I can't think of anything like the only thing I could I, the only part I genuinely liked outside of this episode was when she was in this white forest talking to a frog that was it that felt the most like black doctor who moment um, but anyway, getting through that was completely worth it just to get to this episode. Uh, and I knew they were going to try something like this, where it's like, it has some cool episode, and I wouldn't have context for anything, and wouldn't be able to watch it. So, that's really the reason I watched it. Anyway, since we still have the 60th anniversary episode coming up next year, I honestly don't know how they're going to top this, um, because they had so many cameos and references. This episode's basically a love letter to classic, and that's why I liked it so much. So the fact that they pulled all the stops for this, and this isn't even the 60th, I don't know what they're going to do. Um, I mean, I'm even excited for whatever the next episode is, because it means we get 14. Um, I'm also wondering if all the actors that they brought back for this as cameos are, like, some kind of foreshadowing they're going to play a larger role in the future? Maybe for the 60th, but they actually be actors this time? Um, I'm hopefully thinking so, because I really don't want this to be just a one-time thing. Like how with the 15th, they had that little bit with Kate, and then he never appeared again until this one. Um, and that's a decade gap, by the way. There's literally, like, decade gaps between his appearances and Sophie and Fred. Uh, yeah, I need to just see the classic dogs bickering with each other again. I literally don't care if it has nothing to do with the plot, and that's the whole episode. I'll fucking take it. Um, there's also the fact that this episode, of course, ended on a cliffhanger. And like I said, I think we're getting, like, three episodes of the 4th or 14th before we get to 16. But anyway, so far, 14 seems identical to 10. I think he's also got adventures in, like, comics and stuff now. I want to check those out, um, but you know what, I'll take literally any either real world or in-universe excuse to watch David Tennant play the doctor again, and they've also heard rumors they're trying to bring back Donna as well, um, I think also played by the original actor, the other actress, which is very cool, because uh, I really like their doctor and companion friendship where it's like after all this romance stuff that happened, they're just, they're friends, they get into arguments, kind of in a, a similar way that the friendship that Six and Perry had, where they just bicker at each other, but it's funny, and they're genuinely best buddies. Um, like, I saw some meme, and I'm going off track, I saw some meme, like, a few days ago, where it was, like, 13 died being surrounded by all these friends, and the 10 essence of her just kind of flared up and just missed Donna that badly that she returned instead, basically. Anyway, um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of stuff, uh, coming up for this series in the future, though I don't know how I'm going to watch it because, uh, it's all going to, the new stuff's going to be put on Disney Plus and I don't have Disney Plus anymore. Uh, and this episode alone honestly got me excited about the series again, especially even outside of all the cameos and stuff, and we have 14 now of David Tennant, which is great, and I heard they're getting one of the writers back, one of the show writers back too, which is cool. Um, so yeah, the new stuff should be coming out like next November. We got like a year of speculation for all this stuff. So I'll probably be healed again, jaw surgery, probably be healed enough again to talk. And I'd want to, because I want to keep reacting to stuff in the show now that I'm excited about it again. But hey, yeah, that's everything. That's my review for this. Uh, if you haven't seen the episode, go watch it. Uh, it's cool. Maybe tell me your thoughts on it or this. And thanks for watching. Bye-bye.